please join me in the call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. We will worship God, our Maker. Let you praise God with song and dance, for God is gracious and loving. Let us bring God glory and honor, for God deserves our praise. Let us pray. Holy One, God of grace and glory, your creative power is beyond imagining. Your love is wider than the whole universe. Your mercy greater than the heights of heaven. Your wisdom deeper than the sea. Maker of all things, you became one of us in Jesus Christ. And through your spirit, you are present with us in every place and every time. We worship you, Father, Christ, and Spirit. One God, now and always. In confidence and honesty, let us confess our sins to God and to one another. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we confess we are a people divided within ourselves and against each other. We cling to the values and habits of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue harm creation and the lives of others. The fears and jealousies we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. The freedom and abundance we enjoy belong mostly to a few when they are God's gift to all. Have mercy upon us, O God. Heal us, forgive us, and set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love. In Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name and we pray as He taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. St. Paul declared that the night is far gone, the day is near. So let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Know that you are forgiven by God's grace, and be at peace with God, with yourself, and with each other. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I noticed that uh, some of you are back to school. 
We will pray for you that, that you may be happy and safe all the time. Okay? Uh, there are all kinds of rocks in the world. There are small rocks, big rocks, tiny rocks, gray rocks, and even shiny rocks. There is just about every kind of rock you can imagine. Rocks are very strong. I have one here. It's, a, it's a small, but it looks like a heart, isn't it? So this is small, so you think I can crush this in my hand? Yeah, I'm trying. But this is very strong. Uh, Psalm 62, 7 says, On God my salvation and my glory rest, the rock of my strength. My refuge is in God. The Bible passage was written by a man named David. He lived a long time ago. And the place where he lived was a hilly country. There were hills, rocks, and caves all throughout the countryside where David grew up. David wrote, God is the rock of my strength. My refuge is in God. God is so powerful and strong. God cannot be crushed, just like I cannot crush the one I have right here. And David also speaks of God as his refuge. A refuge is a place of safety, maybe like a cave on a mountain. David knew about being in trouble and hiding out. David had been in trouble time and time again. No matter how hard David fought against his enemies, he always knew God had been the one who really had kept him safe. David knew God had protected him. So here in my hand, I have a small rock. It would be impossible to hide behind this little rock or to crush it in our hand. David used picture language, saying God is strong and powerful like a rock. We can go to God when we don't feel safe or have a problem. This little rock reminds me that when I am sad or mad or scared, I can go to God and He will be my strength and my refuge. So I can pray to God and tell God everything. When we see a rock, we can remember that God is strong and is ready to protect us and offer us God's strength. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are strong like a rock and you are our refuge so that where we are with you, we are safe. I lift up our children to you, O oh God, so protect them so that they can be safe wherever they are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture this sixth day of September 2020 is chosen from the book of Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. I read, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into consideration the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animal you choose must be year old males without defect. 
and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it hissed. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. A second lesson is taken from the Gospel of Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 to 14. Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 to 14. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law the commandments you shall not commit adultery you shall not murder you shall not steal you shall not covet and whatever other command there may be a sum up in this one command love your neighbor as yourself love does not harm to a neighbor therefore love is the fulfillment of the law and do this understanding the present time the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed the night is nearly over the day is almost here so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, nor not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. We continue our reading with um, a scripture from Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 to 20. Matthew 18 15 to 20. I continue reading. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, Take one or two others along, and so, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whenever you bind, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven again truly i tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for 
it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. This is the word of the Lord. In our gospel reading for today, Jesus speaks to the challenge of being in community. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, In a lot of ways, it is a real nuisance to belong to a community. It would be so much easier if we were just a bunch of individuals loosely bound by similar beliefs, but whose affairs remained an essentially private matter between us and God. But according to Jesus, there is no such thing as privacy in the family of God. Our life together is the cheap means God has chosen for being with us, and it is of ultimate importance to God. Our life together is the place where we are comforted, confronted, tested, and redeemed by God through one another. Jesus recognizes that being part of Christian community will not relieve us of brokenness. He is clear that being Christian doesn't mean avoiding conflict and that discord should not be allowed to faster and infect the entire body. How we relate to one another in Christian community is a concern in his heart. And Jesus lays out how conflicts are to be handled by a Christian community. And quite simply, his prescription is to talk about things openly, honestly, and directly, person to person. In his book, The Great Divorce, the British writer C.S. Lewis paints a picture of hell that is haunting. Hell is like a vast gray city, Lewis says, a city inhabited only at its outer edges, with rows and rows of empty houses in the middle. Empty because everyone who wants, wants to live in them has quarreled with the neighbors and moved, and quarreled with the new neighbors and moved again leaving empty streets full of empty houses behind them, and so on and so on, until finally no one could even see anyone else. That, Louis says, is how hell got so large, empty at the center and inhabited only on the fringes. That's what Jesus wants us to avoid. Jesus wants people who have been hurt to talk directly to the one who hurt them and to lay things out in an honest fashion in hopes of having the issues worked out. Now note that he does not suggest that one person should be the winner and one the loser. No, what he wants from this direct communi communication is reconciliation. Both parties getting back, as much as is possible, to a place of shared care and concern, of forgiveness and understanding. If the person asks for forgiveness and acknowledges the wrong done, then the issue is to be put to rest. That is Jesus' prescription. That means that we are enjoined by Christ to forgive our brothers and sisters who ask forgiveness. If the offense does not stop, if the relationship becomes hostile, we need to take it one step further, Jesus suggests. We need to utilize Christian brothers and sisters that act as mediators. If the offender will not listen to the offended person, then the offended person is to bring two or three witnesses 
and point out the wrong in the presence of the witnesses and the offender. If the offender still will not listen, then the offended person is to tell it to the church. If the offender will not listen even to the church, then they are to be treated as an outsider. And I would submit to you that Jesus wasn't really talking about putting people out of the community in a literal sense, at least not in most cases. I think it was more like an extension of what Lewis talks about in The Great Divorce. The people disagree, refuse to be reconciled, and then begin to live farther and farther apart, putting themselves out of the community. So as we have seen, Jesus offers a simple guide to help us handle our sin and its consequences here. But far more importantly, Jesus promises us that he is present, that he is, his presence is real for us. When we gather in his name, both in agreement and in sin, Jesus says, again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, I, it, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, I am there among them. If Jesus is going to be present where two or three gather, Jesus is going to be present when that gathering turns into grappling. Certainly, that's reassuring, knowing that Jesus won't give up on us. Because we all know that in the midst of conflict, it's always easier just to walk away, right? However, in this passage, there is a sense of commitment on the part of Jesus to be with us in both our times of unity and our times of divisiveness. Think about it. Have you ever seen anyone grow spiritually by writing off another believer and walking away? No. Like me, you have probably been amazed at how people grow when they refuse to walk away and choose instead to do the hard work of being reconciled to someone who has hurt them. I know there are times where we must walk away. Sometimes fights are unfair. Sometimes conflict is so entrenched in a community that we have to walk away. Sometimes the fighting is not in Jesus' name. But oftentimes, walking toward conflict, walking toward dissension, engaging in debate are the ways that we grow. Let's be honest. None of us like conflict. None of us like to grapple. It is easier, most of the time, to be silent or just to let it go. But disagreements and debate are part of being church. Healthy debate and dialogue, asking questions of one another, holding each other accountable. These are all important characteristics of being church. Without them, we never go anywhere. We never make progress and we never grow as people of faith. Nevertheless, just as Jesus reminds us that he will still be with us, even in the messiest of circumstances. So too, are we called to stay with one another through thick and thin? If we are committed to one another, if our spirit is a reconciling one, if our conflicts are in Jesus' name, then we will be able to disagree with one another, grapple with each other, and come out a more faithful community as a result.
It is okay to grapple with one another. Grappling is part of gathering. But to do, but do so with a reconciling spirit, committed to your neighbor, committed to your church. Just like everything else you do, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. We have Christ's example. We have his instruction and his encouragement. And more than that, we have his assurance that he is with us in every conflict. His love will see us through. For where two or three come together in my name, I am with you. Amen. This time of lessened activity has been a good time for reflection and meditation on the things that matter. What has struck me is the impermanence of things. The bumper sticker once said, whoever dies with the most toys wins. But I believe that bumper st sticker is trumped by the one that says, whoever dies with the most toys dies. When we really think about it, everything is impermanent. Toys, buildings, churches, friends, even our own bodies, which will eventually sicken and decay and fail us. There's only one thing that has real permanence, that is our relationship with Jesus Christ and our decision to follow or not to follow him. In Matthew 6, 19 to 20, Jesus tells us that we shouldn't build up our treasures on things that are impermanent, but on those that last eternally. Such is the work of God's people. Such is the work of God's people at Centennial that continues despite our not gathering together at 103 Pinetown Place. Our expenses continue. The bills still need to be paid. The fact that we are not seeing each other face to face does not in any way lessen our needs. Please remember your commitment to God and to Centennial as you prepare your offering. A reminder of the three ways you can give will appear on the screen. Details are on our website. Let us prepare to give. Let us pray. Lord God, receive this gift, offered in a spirit of generosity and humility. Bless and use them for the work that you long to do in the world. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now I'll say the benediction, so let us pray again. People of God, the truth seeks to break in upon you in the most unexpected places and times, and from the most unlikely of sources. As you go your way this week, open your hearts and minds to hear and receive the transforming word, however it may come to you. And know that Father, Son, and Spirit go with you to lead you to the truth that can set you free. Amen. <laughs>